As I mentioned to the children moments ago, there's a story in the book of Acts recalling some Jesus followers who had been with the Apostle Paul when he was preaching in the city of Thessalonica. You don't have to remember that. But basically what happened was these people were dragged by an angry mob before the city authorities and accused in public of this. The mob said, these people have been turning the world upside down. Which meant, and the, the mob continued, they are acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying that there is another king whose name is Jesus. Busted, right? That is exactly what these people were doing. Their preaching had told of this man named Jesus who was crucified and raised from the dead and that he was the one truly sent by God. He is the one we ought to really listen to rather than the emperor. That is turning the world upside down. Reversing the rules of who is in charge and how things are presumed to work. There was a powerful emperor in Rome, but the real king was this humble teacher named Jesus. Empires will rise and fall, but the kingdom Jesus spoke of will last forever. And how we seek to enter it makes all the difference. That's exactly what the church was preaching. That's exactly the message I intend to preach today. That's exactly the message that children can remind us to hear. To such children belongs the kingdom of God. Pastor, that's cute and all, right? It's CDC Sunday, but what does this really mean? Well, thank you for asking, friends. I want to take a look. In the Bible reading that we heard today, in Luke's gospel, Jesus told a parable Right before this episode with the children, Jesus told a parable about a proud man and a humble man who both went to the temple to pray. The proud man basically stood up and thanked God that he wasn't like those lesser types of people. Thank you, God, that I'm not one of them, one of those sinners. The humble man, though, also went there to pray and simply asked God to show mercy upon him. God, have mercy on me. I am not worthy, but here I am. Admitted that he had faults and did not deserve high praise. And Jesus concluded by saying that that second man, the humble one, went home justified. He was the one who was made right with God on that day. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then Luke tells us that people were bringing little children to Jesus. Infants even, so that Jesus might bless them, touch them, protect them, heal them. But some of Jesus' crew tried to chase him away, right? Get away. He's busy. Leave our teacher alone. Who do you think you are? We all know what Jesus said, though. Let the children come. The kingdom of God belongs to them. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Friends, children are many things. They are cute, impressionable, imaginative, trusting, innocent, playful, and friendly. They are wide-eyed and eager to learn. They can also be irritable and lacking certain skills, unable to do many things that mature people can do, like reading, for example. There is a childlike sense of wonder toward the world that I'm sure many of us grown-ups long for. There is a possibility that lies before them, as in, oh, you kids have your whole life ahead of you, what I wouldn't give to be your age again. And yet, there are other qualities of children, especially infants, that set them apart from those who are older. Children are vulnerable. They are dependent on others to care for them. There is little pride among infants, only a desire of love, a desire that those who care for them would show them love and shelter them when they are in need. And these, I believe, are what this lesson 
this teaching of Jesus is most about. Children in the ancient world, when this scripture was written, they were beyond vulnerable. They were fortunate to survive their childhood at all. This is a bit morbid, but in the times that the New Testament was written, it's estimated that fewer than half of all children who survived their childbirth made it to age 16. Fewer than half made it to age 16 because of disease, because of famine, sometimes because of war. And as much as we love to romanticize the beauty and contagious vitality of children, we must admit that they are desperately needing the attention of grown-ups to survive. And even with a great deal of attention, parents have reasons to worry, right? About the many things in this world that might harm our children. But nevertheless, no matter how much we parents are concerned, children generally are eager to get on with it to discover whatever life might hold and pursue people who bring them joy. You with me? Which in our story was none other than Jesus. And by extension, all of us, as we attempt to embody the spirit that was, in work, that was at work in Jesus, the loving, welcoming presence of the living God. Friends, this message makes use of children, and I've already given them a special lesson on what it means. But make no mistake, this lesson is for all of us. And children are the ones who teach us today. They are the example that we are to follow. Yes, with our enthusiasm and every other romantic quality, but also vulnerability, friends, humility, and the willingness to ask for help when we need it. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. That's right. Not only are children proper, but anyone who is vulnerable, who is in need of care, who is at risk in our society, God has a special welcome for them. And so must we. And as far as we presume to approach our Lord and seek a place in his kingdom, our disposition needs to be that of a little child, a humble, vulnerable being in need of God's care. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. If anyone presumes to know it all, to confidently think that they have it together better than anybody else, sure of their own deservedness for favor and completely self-reliant, then I suppose that person has no need for God. But if, on the other hand, If we are honest and admit that we don't have all of our stuff together, that we're not perfect, that we sure could use a hand, then I have good news for you, church. God loves you, and you are in the exact right place and posture to approach and receive a blessing. Status, according to the ways of this world, mean very little to Jesus. His kingdom is an upside-down one. You with me? He calls especially to those less fortunate and those who need him most. Those of us who can't get enough of how beautiful this God whom Jesus reveals really is, we want nothing more than for everyone else to come and meet him. And we want so badly for everyone to understand that his work involves turning things upside down, not arranging ourselves the way the world does. But Jesus shows us a different way. Those who think they're too good need to be honest and embrace some humility and admit that they are not saints and could use some renovation of their hearts and their lives. And those who think they're unworthy and not good enough need to know that they may always come as they are, not needing to clean up their act first or grow up before God will love you. That's nonsense. Trust that God's love is exactly that which will hold us, carry us, and allow us to grow into something more. So let the children come. 
Let even the infants come to me, Jesus said. It is to such as these that the kingdom belongs. And as we pray so very often, those who know it, God, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're not really talking about going to heaven, friends. We're talking about heaven coming here. That's what all this kingdom talk is about. Despite what you may have heard, the primary purpose of the Christian faith is not to get to heaven when you die. Although that's all bound up with it, and that can be assured if you need it to be. But the first purpose is to transform the world here and now. Starting with a people of faith so that God's ways will become our ways, so that Jesus' love will become our love, so that the destructive forces that surround us would be upended and all creation which suffers would be met, set right. There are powerful forces and rulers and influences at work around us, but the real king is the God made known in this humble teacher named Jesus. We dare to live by his ways rather than what the authorities tell us. We seek a love which is deeper than any formal institution can promise. And if we are to be faithful to the spirit that was in Jesus, we need to welcome the children among us, caring for them as if they were our own, or even better. I've only been with this church for a couple of years, but I'm really proud of what this church has done. Fifty years ago, this congregation decided that it would be a good idea to open up a child care center in this building. And so the CDC was born. It was never intended to be a business opportunity, nor did it carry any particular motives other than to serve the children and families of this community so that the ministry of this church would, beyond, would extend beyond our own worship and service life to so many families and children who surround us. Today, this commitment and dedication to service continues. Thanks be to God. And we believe it has a very bright future. For the record, I love my job, my role here as pastor. A minor downside of the work of pastoral ministry is that many report it can be a bit lonely. Suppose that's true, but I have yet to suffer much in that regard because of so many of you. One of my favorite parts of my days of my week is seeing these children in these hallways, in these classrooms. The enthusiasm, the joy, the excitement. These children are vulnerable, yes. They need a great deal of care, yes. And they get it here. But friends, the joy. Sometimes I walk into a room and it's like a switch goes on and it's party time. I'm not even kidding, right? Kids come running, jumping, smiling, hands in the air. These kids are alive, friends, as we ought to be as well. Awake and celebrating that which gives us hope and remembering that we are in need of something more than ourselves. That's exactly how I pray we might learn to approach God with an unquenchable thirst for that which comes to us with open arms and a promise that we are loved, that's the God we find in Jesus, himself having come into the world as a vulnerable infant, later to embody all that God has to show us. What a wonderful symbol all of you children are for us to learn from. That's about enough out of me. I've said my piece. In a moment, I invite us to stand and sing for joy as we close our time together. And I encourage us all to sing boldly this festive song, proclaiming the wonder of all creation for the God who has given every good and perfect gift. Sing, church, with the vigor of a child whose parent just arrived at the end of the day. Sing with the joy of a child who can't wait to give Pastor Joel a high five in the hallway. 
and sing with the joy of a child running to Jesus for a blessing, knowing that he or she is welcome in his arms. Carry with you the peace and comfort that your whole life is in the hands of the living God, and may our world's ways continue to be overturned by the joy we dare live into as God's kingdom continues to come. Amen. Amen. Let us sing.